We have participants who are coming in. So what I'll do is as you, as we start, I'll, you know, keep accepting uh, the BU Power Foodie participants. Uh, just to give a quick recap, Zara Stream is a, is a platform uh, for young women who want to unapologetically be themselves, powerfully, and also building on, um, you know, on the value of, uh, of togetherness and, and sisterhood. I think it's really important to, to look at that and, and looking at how we can tap into each other's uh, connections and solidarity to, to build on opportunity and to build our confidence and all of those uh, very important tools for, for young women to thrive. So today we have the pleasure to be joined by our sisters Ida and Elena, all the way from Addis. <laughs> So we're really happy and excited because Addis is home and we're happy to, to have our sisters coming together. It's a powerful force. Uh, Ida is a communicator. She's been a communicator for over 10 years, uh, working in international development, using communications and digital platforms uh, to tell stories and really recenter the voices of African people and women, you know, with a feminist perspective uh, into the work that she's doing. And we also have her sister, Elina, you know, they're not telling, but they're actually in the same room. Huh? <laughs> and Elena is, uh, is the founder of the Yellow Movement in Ethiopia. And I'm sure you've heard of it. It's uh, the academic feminist-led movement for young women. And today, it's uh, very important to have her sister Elena, who's going to also join Ida in telling why telling our, our stories matters and why it's important, you know. And we're looking now what's happening around the world, particularly around the Black Lives Movement. I think we have, you know, as Africans, we, we have uh, this strong um, sense uh, of urgency of recentering our own narratives and making sure that we own it and that we don't get uh, to be told what our stories uh, are you know from from other people so without any further waiting because i know that uh, all those are streamers and our sisters on the call are excited to like me as we can see to to get to hear our sisters Elena and, and hida so let me open the floor and and please come in thank you right so so we're really excited I think there's a Nico, I think, because uh, Helena's mic is on. I it's off. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Oh, perfect. Now it's gone. Okay, perfect. Okay, wonderful. So, um, hello, everyone, and hello, Verlaine. Um, so, Helena and I are very excited uh, to join you, and we'd really like to thank you for choosing to spend your evening. Um, your afternoon and even your morning with us uh, today. It's a beautiful Saturday out here. It's been raining like crazy in Addis, so it's nice that there's a lot of sun. Um, so thank you, Verlin, for picking on that topic about uh, Black Lives Matter and the need for us as Africans to tell our story. I don't know if people have seen recently um, African descent um, leadership at the UN. They wrote an op-ed where they were really vocal about this. And honestly, um, it is a time that as Africans, we really need to tell our story because we have rich cultural and historical heritage. It's just sad that um, most of our stories have just you know, gone missing. And it's, it's, it's because of, of a lot of gaps. It's because we didn't create some of the platforms, but we really have an opportunity to turn that around and use existing platforms to tell our stories. So first off, we'd like to uh, congratulate uh, Verlaine on creating Zahara's uh, Dream because it's an amazing and game changer platform, really, as she talked about it earlier. It's a platform where women get to share their stories and um, not just to share their stories for the sake of it, but to learn from each other. So today we're going to be talking about um, storytelling. It's for both Helena and I, it's a passion. I didn't start off uh, as a storyteller, but I believe that um, everyone is a storyteller when you're born. Um, I don't have kids, but I always watch my friends' kids when in a scenario when uh, a child falls and gets up and mom or dad doesn't do anything, then the child will start wailing and crying. And then when the child tells the mother or the father a story, you know what, I fell and I got up and I dusted myself. And then the child gets a hug you know, in a way, the child has told a story. Um, so I believe that it's really for us to keep telling 
Yeah. I think the, the, the connection is slightly breaking up. Can you hear? Really? Yes, unfortunately. No. <laughs> Sorry, we're doing this in America as well. Chris Zoom is off. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, technology and internet connections are not going to stop us. We're going to keep going. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hi, V. Thank you so much for having us. Um, I'm very happy that Ida is, will be doing most of the talking because she has been much more than I do. Um, but we are hoping to talk about our careers, but also in a way cover the part of storytelling and what it means for us and um, how we can relate to the stories around the world and how we can contribute to every conversation around us. Um, and maybe great. So thank you for thank you for spending the afternoon with us. That's I know it's Saturday, not many people are going to be here around, but we're very happy to see lots of sisters in the discussion. Uh, my name is Helena Brahanu and I've been well shuttling back and forth between different careers, but most importantly, I've been a feminist academic and activist. Um, and I think those spaces, of course, they're different, but they kind of fit into each other. And um, I've been doing research consultancy in the past. And what I would like to talk about today is it's okay to shuttle back and forth between carriers um, and then find the best way to tell, to tell your stories or whatever you feel passionate about. Uh, but in a way, it's very traditional and combining stories that want. Having social media platforms specifically, I'm afraid of that space of different platforms and reaching out to a wider base of audience. Not Ida, Elena, uh, my, my, my dears, I think there's a slight challenge with, uh, with the connection. We cannot hear you, so perhaps could we try? without the video although it's very sad because it would have been so wonderful to to see both of you just to see if it's working better i think the the connection is uh is a bit uh is a bit challenging but we shall overcome <laughs> I think you're muted, huh? Can you hear me now? Yes. Um, so I was speaking about how the academic space is very confining and... Yeah. Can you hear me? Good. I think... Is it not I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, the echo is gone. Apologies. Now we we're we're all together and we we're gonna make it smooth. About how that couldn't um, very much limited to a different audience and in doing an active an activism I get to speak to different people and address issues of gender equality things that I'm passionate about the most in a very flexible um, and true format and that's why I chose both uh, professions and kind of shuttling back between the two back and forth at times so um, and I'm hoping that uh, the conversation uh, much of the, the discussion that we're going to have will come out of the question an answer session, the QA, I think, um, and anything else that I need to cover, we'll discuss, right? All right, good. Uh, do you want me to go ahead and? Yeah. Well, I'm sorry about the biological challenges, but um, 
I always get inspired by Helena's story. Uh, we met in 2015 when she was going to Yali, if I am not mistaken. Uh, she was the youngest uh, Yali fellow at that time going from Ethiopia. She went a year after I went. And since then, we've been friends. Uh, we've worked on several girls' projects together because we're very passionate about uh, girls' uh, activities. So to tell you a little bit about myself, um, really. OK, uh, am I audible? I'm just going to do this without a video. Yes, thank you, E. And it's such a pity we cannot see, we cannot see you. But your story is so important, and we're so excited to hear you. Thank you, E. Right, so, right, so, um, talking about myself, so I was raised between Ethiopia and Kenya, which I call uh, H squared, which is my homes and my heritages. And um, so I grew up in a very multicultural um, environment. So in my primary and secondary school, uh, my sub favorite subjects were basically anything that involved writing. And this could be composition, uh, dictation. Yeah, this could be composition, this could be dictation, or anything that had to do um, with writing. Also, um, so when I joined university, I decided to study history for my undergrad studies. And this was in the backdrop of being told that I wouldn't get a job or that I wouldn't uh, have a fulfilling career. So I sort of felt that, okay, uh, I, I'm going to do this because the reason that I chose history is that I always want to know. And I felt that knowing your background really helps you to know your present and your future. So I enjoyed studying history. And when I was in university at that time, I loved organizing things. And two uh, events that I remember very well are we worked with the Italian and US embassies to look at Ethio-Italian and Ethio-US uh, stories, because Ethiopia is one of the oldest histories on the continent. And that was a great learning platform for me as well to tell um, the African story from a different um, perspective. Um, and it was also the time that I took on my first jobs, which was as a researcher and editor on a book that was going to look at um, the history and the evolution of uh, the Organization for African Unity, OAU, and its transition to the African Union. So what were the founding fathers thinking and what had progressed in that period and what were the aspirations that the African Union had? Um, then. After that, I wanted to work, but um, I mean, I wanted to go back to school, but then I decided, let me work uh, a little bit. So I then decided to become a teacher, and which is ironically one of the professions that I was told that studying history, I would end up becoming a teacher and not make money. <laughs> but I enjoyed uh, working as a teacher because I worked with kids for as young as three-year-olds in preschool up until 16-year-olds uh, who were preparing to sit for their um, Cambridge School Leaving exam. And then I also took on a side job as an English as a second language teacher to professional adults who were much older than me at the time. Those were also situations where, uh, you know, as a teacher, you uh, share the story of a, a textbook. And it's your job to sort of transition between telling a child of three years old to a 16 year old what the book is saying. So that in itself is, um, uh, storytelling for me. Um, so after that job, I joined a uh, university. So I went, I, I actually wanted to study archaeology because for me, uh, archaeology was important because it would fill in the gaps of questions that I had uh, in my history studies. But I missed the exam. So I was in campus, I had all my papers, then I heard that people were going for applications for a uh, master's in peace and security. And I thought, okay, I'm here, I need to do something. I can either sit and wait, not sit and wait, but work for another year and then come back for uh, applications the next year or I can use this opportunity. So at that point I decided, okay, I'm going to apply for this. And the decision I had to take at that time was, how do I connect the history that I have learned and the past of Africa to 
that context of the peace and security issues that were troubling the continent at that time. So I took the exam and the interest exam, one question that I will never forget was, um, do you believe in the unity of Africa? And for me, as optimistic as I always am, I said yes, and I explained why I thought that was the situation at the time, and I got it. So one of the um, storytelling dis things that I learned at that point is you have to decide to write. That's the first thing you have to do. Um, so I got into that, continued to be an organizer, worked on a number of uh, projects with other students and so forth. Then um, during that time, I also started uh, interning with the University uh, for Peace Africa program. And at that time, we, I had an opportunity to follow uh, as one of the researchers, as a research assistant to Western Ethiopia, where we sat with uh, South Sudanese refugees. And these refugees, the reason we had gone there is to look at peace uh, education vis-a-vis -vis traditional mechanisms of building peace. So this was also interesting for me because Africa has a huge uh, wealth of oral tradition. And like I said before, some of this gets lost because we don't put these things in writing, but I am what I am today because of the stories that my grandmother told me. And this is how Africans keep their stories going. You know, it goes from generation to generation and that's how we keep that identity uh, going. So that was a good way of me now getting into um, research, a kind of storytelling as well. So it was a great project in terms of me learning a different style of writing, which would be to talk about uh, UNESCO um, ideals of peace education and combining this with African traditional wealth in uh, peace building. So um, after that, uh, I then started working and uh, in development and humanitarian um, reporting as well. So that was, So a new challenge for me. So I had to evolve from the research writing to now more corporate writing. And for me, development and humanitarian um, writing is very different. Um, it can be challenging at times because when you look at development, for example, you are, and you have person A and B, you're telling person A, person B or institution B is doing something, they're building something or they're doing something today that will benefit person A in five years time. So, and person A needs that thing right now. So how do you make person A understand that they are part of the process? Um, how do you make them understand that their contribution also matters? So that's a different way of writing, a whole different way of writing uh, in itself. When you come to the humanitarian space as well, you might want to tell the story of someone in need, but how do you maintain this person's um, dignity? How do you tell this story in a compelling, empathetic matter, manner? Sorry. So, um, Storytelling evolves, you know, it really depends on the audience that you're looking at. It, it, I feel one has to be able to put themselves in this person's shoes and, you know, understand what this person is trying to tell. And then you as the middle person then go on and tell the story. It's the same if you're telling about your own story, but when you're telling uh, another person's story, it's really important to understand what that person is about and what it is a message that that person is trying to tell. So in a nutshell, for me, um, storytelling is uh, two things. One, I, the goal in telling st stories for me is one, to inform, and second, to inspire action. To inform, in a sense, is will that person reading what I have written learn something? And second, will that person reading uh, want to do something about the information that they have gotten. So I will stop here and then um, like Helena and I said earlier, we hope that the conversation will uh, develop more when we are doing the Q&A session. So thank you. Let's try it. Um, I'm not going to go through the entire, okay, so I'm just going to keep it short and talk about how um, activism, I think, 
and because that's that's a very important aspect of how, why I'm telling the stories today. You can hear me right? All right, great. Um, so I, I did law school and that's when I decided to do stories and I decided to be an activist because I felt like the, well, the professional side of law schooling is that you get to be a lawyer, a judge, and there are a couple of options that you have, but truly I felt very dull and boring at the time. And I knew that there was so much of work to be done, especially in gender justice. And that's uh, when it, I decided to be active within the activism space. And for me, I think for someone who just finished law school at the time, because I'm starting a bit late in life, um, the most important question was, how do you make your passion pay your bills? Because it's really important that you get to eat your food and you get to pay it too. Um, you get, and that you have the, the, the right kind of resources around you. Um, and that feel like you, you um, your job is good enough for you to do whatever you want. Um, although I was really interested in telling stories, I also wanted to pursue another passion. Um, that's why I talked about shuttling between two different professions. And I really loved and enjoyed teaching. That was, that was very important. I wanted to teach in the university. I wanted to be um, able to do lawyerly work as well. But activism was another important passion of mine. And I needed to combine both and make sure that I was eating my <laughs> appropriately, that I was getting the right kind of finances, but also following my passion at the same time. And I understand that, especially within activism, uh, within the context of Africa specifically, um, there is so much of romanticism of the activism, you know, being poor, you know, activists being poor, not having enough resources, and chasing funding, and then this and that. I didn't want to, I, I really didn't want to do that. Um, for me, I think it was really important to create my own platform and to be able to deliver the message that I wanted to do um, in my own way without being influenced by external factors and external actors. And so I, of justice and I knew that um, if I was practicing law that's one way of it and um, if I was teaching as well and then activism on the side as well um, I started thinking a bit um, early in the law school while I was doing activism and I think it was very important for me to write through paradox and humor and making sure that I was connecting with the right kind of audience um, but it was very hard too because in, in the Ethiopian activist space, it's very hard to be genuine, to stay you know, authentic and to have your own independent voice without being judged. And as women, I think we tend to fall in the trap of wanting to be liked and accepted. Uh, it has a very gendered angle, but in general as humans, that we do have that tendency. So I wanted to stay honest to the agenda that I have at the time, I had at the time. And now it was very important uh, that on the track of activism and on the track of delivering gender equality and justice that I had, I was telling true stories, that I was connecting with the audience and that I was delivering the right kind of message. Um, so for me, what academia did for me was it kind of fed and supported my activism. I think if you don't have the right kind of evidence, if you can't mobilize evidence, if you can't depend on research, I don't think you can tell a full and complete story. I think it will just be making noise and that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted it to be very purposeful and uh, impact driven. So I had information coming and research coming from the academic side of things. And then the activist would be able to create telling those stories that I've had in different spaces. And I guess I find the logic and value. So throughout my storytelling, my, my value kind of remained the same. And I wanted to be accountable to everyone. Um, at the same time, I wanted to be open and transparent and learn from the process as well. I think as storytellers, we tend to forget that we have a lot to learn from others as well. And it's very important to, to stay um, humble and have the humility to learn from others as well. And change anyways, because what you're doing when you're telling a story is you want it to have some, some sort of change. And change is a lifetime occupation. It's not, it's not going to end in one go. Um, you get to do it all the time. I'm not sure if the internet is there. And then, Um, so, as an activist and as a storyteller, my aim was to help the petty political memory of the country and the commitment to remind people that this is what we deserve, this is what we do, and this is how we should do it. But at the same time, I, I also get to learn from what others think and develop my story in a way that can connect uh, with my audience at the same time. And so it was very important for me that in my stories that I, you know, aim for political transformation. Uh, that I was giving attention to the political grammar, that I was 
know, um, telling people and speaking with. Um, and then I remain ethically accountable too, that I was not corrupt in what I deliver, so that I don't pull these stories um, so that people can buy it and like it and all that. Um, although it w I have my target, I, and I think it was never my target to please people. It was always about telling the truth, um, speaking truth to power and inspiring confidence and the kind of um, agenda and stories that I was covering. So those are the things that I really put into consideration. The most important being political transformation and re remaining ethically accountable. Um, that's pretty much it, I think. I, do, I don't have a paper story, but, <laughs> but I guess through questions, I get to answer them and please speak more about activism and do the academic space as well. Really? Thank you so much. Thank you, my sisters. And I'm sorry that we had a bit of a technical issue with the, with the video, but your, your stories, both you, Ida and Ilina, were very powerful. And, you know, I'm sure that uh, our sisters who are listening have been able to grasp, you know, some of the why you're, you know, telling our stories is important. Uh, but also from your own experience, how you actually get to, to get to that point of creating your own platform and, you know, also staying true, as you mentioned, to, to the stories that you share. Uh, now we're entering the Q&A, so perhaps um, our sisters who want to, to ask questions, uh, please raise your hand and then, of course, you'll be called into, into the floor to, to share your question and don't hesitate to, to turn on your camera so we can say hi and, and see you. Thank you. And I forgot to say, don't be shy. <laughs> Okay, if there's not a question for the moment, perhaps I do actually have a question for our sister Elena. Vivian, I see Vivian. Okay, Vivian, do you want to come? Hi. In? Okay, yes, please. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning. Here in Nigeria, it's past three in the afternoon. So, um, saying good afternoon to my sisters. Thank you for sharing your stories with us. I did learn a lot from you. And um, my question is about um, our sisters representing themselves, you know, um, coming into the spotlight without intimidation, without biases. I don't know what um, I'm going to call that. I don't know if they're really um, shy about it, coming to the spotlight to talk about uh, their, uh, their experiences, to share their stories, or to take the mantle of leadership, because I feel it is important to um, share our knowledge, to change the narrative as sisters and as young women. So my question is, how can we help our younger girls to achieve that? to weight off the insecurity issues that they have around them. How can we do that? How can we help them achieve that self-confidence, you know, coming to help, coming to be a voice, coming to uplift other women like them? Perhaps, yeah, do you want to take more questions or do you want to answer this one first? I think we, we could just uh, go step by step. Well, uh, are there other questions? Well, you, well, Not for the moment. You come in? Not for yeah. the moment. Perhaps you, you can go ahead. Okay, great. So, Vivian, thank you so much for your question, and, and it's a very important question. Um, Helena alluded to it before. Um, in this continent, we're raised to be shy. We're raised to, um, as a girl, you're raised to, you know, stay behind and not really yeah. um, tell your story. You know, you're raised to not raise your voice and those um, kinds of things. For me, I think what really helped me is um, having a mentor. You know, and that's what I try to do a lot in um, the work that I do um, girls. You know, for me, um, 
Verlaine talked about it before, you know, uh, there's no need to apologize to for you okay. being vocal, you know, but you know, yes. you only are able to do something about it if you have the information, right? Okay. Which is why for us who have gone uh, before, we need to keep on telling stories and encourage those those girls who are coming um, after us. There's culture, uh, there's, there's so many things that hold uh, African girls back you know so it's like yes you, and we we can't really fix everyone's problems but if you're able to help one girl tell her story you know and, and these things you happen to have a ripple effect you know if one girl is able to come out and tell her story and her friends see it and they see the impact then they too will be encouraged but for us who have gone before we need to be able to reach out and help them understand that, yes, there are barriers. We've gone through those barriers too. You know, we're not sitting here because we haven't had to deal with those issues. But there were some things that we said, okay. you know what, I am going to do what I can and I am going to defy the odds and try to do this. So you, I think we need to help them navigate these issues. We need to help be their mentors. And I think mentorship is really important. And I love that um, Zahara's Dream has a, that platform. You know? All right. Um, <clears throat> so I think um, you did cover a lot, um, but one thing to add would be to be honest about our, our experiences as well. I think I've done so many times and uh, that taught me a lot in telling the stories and telling it in a very brave um, way. The first thing would be that um, we all have, have our own biases, so nobody's actually exempted from that sort of feel. But the most important in telling the story is to make sure that you come from a place of research and that you have enough kind of knowledge to move forward and to be able to tell it really well. But other than that, if, if you're doing the work, if you've done, um, if you have the right kind of resources and if you believe in the story, I think you should be able to tell it. And what is holding many women back, of course, is the cultural aspect of it, the social cultural aspect. I think we're, we're, we're so very I felt so many times that I've learned it to be part of the experience now that I guess people to share our stories over and over again, tell people that we're very um, I Because I'm public, because I'm public with my writing, I think many of the lessons that I've learned, um, I've learned it in a very public space. And so that means it's a lot of pressure. Then, I mean, the issue Really? Bigger and magnified when you're doing it. In Helena, Medu, I'm so sorry. Mm -hmm. I think that I understand we all come from different backgrounds. Hilly, I think diverse backgrounds, and we don't have the same kind of path. Um, so that's something that I'm recognizing. And myself and Ida, we try our best to kind of mentor people within our space. Um, Ida was my mentor. I actually reached out to her um, via email when I wanted to when I wanted to be helped in that way. And that helped me. So I, I really want to make it a tradition and a, you know, collective effort for us to be able to do that to others as well, to be able to give out and, um, and share our experiences. That's what we're doing today. But the most important aspect of it is, yes, you're going to make mistakes um, in telling your stories or in sharing a story and sh sharing a public space. You're not going to be perfect. That's fine. It's acceptable. Make sure that you have the humility to learn, listen, and move forward with a better story. Um, and I, I'm not asking for people to, to mend their stories, but because there is so much of an amenability in our story, uh, we want to please everyone. That's not possible. Um, so I think mm -hmm. learning from it, moving forward, and knowing that you will make mistakes, and it's okay for women to make mistakes as well. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Okay. Thank you very much for your response. Thank you. Thank you, Vivian. Thank you, Elena. Thank you, Ida, for, for the powerful responses. Uh, perhaps we can, uh, if uh, we have another sister who would like to ask a question. Thank you.
So someone in the after we have a mentorship program. Yeah, um, we do. But yeah, we do have a mentorship program. Um, Ida is the one running it at the at the moment. Um, it's called Berchi, um, an Amharic word for encouraging women and um, telling them that we're we're going to be there to support them as well. We don't have many mentees because we're really afraid of taking a lot and not being able to deliver. But we have uh, five girls under our help, uh, getting both financial help and mentorship as well, uh, coming from different. Uh, departments within Addis Ababa University. Unfortunately, we have not um, opened up the program for people outside higher educational institutions, but, but, but that's something that we hope to do in the future. Thank you, Hilly. Uh, Dami, do you want to come in? Hello. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, my dear. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Oh, my name is Damilola um, from Nigeria. Uh, it's afternoon. It's afternoon here. So um, my question is on um, storytelling. So um, I so much connect to that part where um, I was talking. I was talking about being um, uh, a law student and also being into advocacy and also having passion to teach. There are things that I, I, I like. I am also studying law. I currently run a blog that shares stories of women. It's uh, gotten across several topics, poverty, menstruation, inequality in workforce, uh, independence. So I share the stories because I, I see them as powerful, I see them as inspiring. But then uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to graduate next year. And when I graduate next year, I'm, I'm going to be like thrown into the real world, you know, the world where you have to be financially independent. I am very, very active in the volunteering sphere. As a, as a student in Nigeria, unfortunately, we don't really have several employment opportunities because personally, I have lost the re-employment opportunities. I, 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 was, I was accepted, like given a job until I just mentioned that I am still an undergraduate and they were like, oh, Oh, sorry, we're looking for graduates. Yeah, okay, so how do you blend all that? And how did you like get to that stage where you, as a person, began to generate revenue? Because of course we have to survive, and we have to make money. So how do you get to that stage? The process involved. I'm not saying give me a one to three, but just like a brief explanation, it will really help. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, um, Ida, Elena, do you want to come in? And then perhaps I see Raju is next. Okay. Yeah, should I go ahead? All right, okay. Um, um, you don't have to be ashamed of wanting to, wanting to eat, uh, wanting to have resources around you and to be paid as well. And that's why sometimes it, it not, depends on the country that you're in, but I know in my country, storytelling will not feed me. And that's a very realistic point um, for me, at, at least. So that's what I, I do as, as a part-time thing. Um, I don't know as part of it. I guess it's, it's about knowing the kind of passions that you have. You can just write them down. And then you should be okay with shuttling back and forth between don't have to put a box around your dreams and say that I'm just a doctor and that's what I'm going to do. For me, that doesn't really work for me. Um, I know that we define things that I have a passion. Elena, do you want to turn off your camera perhaps and, and keep the audio? I think it's breaking up. Official formal society structure, and that's another way of doing it as well. But personally, because I really didn't want to be influenced by um, money, but at the same time, I don't have a problem with it. Um, I needed to decide and
Elena. Eda, I don't know if you can hear me. Eda? The microphone is breaking. Perhaps my sister's. That will make my narrative here and there. So I really wanted to be focused on, on that independently. And so I don't get paid for activism, but I do get paid for teaching. I do get paid for doing consultancy. I do get paid for doing research. So you can be a lawyer, you can study law, that's fine. But, but you can figure out the things that works for you. So you don't have to be one thing, you don't have to do one thing. You can tell your stories at night, but you have to find a way to feed yourself during the day. And that's very important as well. As women, we look down on economical aspects of things and we don't really value getting money. But money is power. Uh, and you need to find a way to make good money and at the same time tell the stories that you want to tell and find a way to balance both in a way. And it's a good thing that you went to law school. There are lots of options for you to do. You can be many things. You're not expected to be a lawyer. You don't have to practice in courts. You're not expected to be a judge. There are so many options for you. You just have to think about which one works for you the best. And if you want to make money for storytelling as well, you can work for a you know, um, a newspaper establishment. Yeah, establishment. There are different institutions that can pay you for that as well. Or you can remain authentic, true, and flexible. I don't have a boss when I'm telling my stories. I write for newspapers, I write for different blogs, and I also write on social media. And that affords me flexibility in telling the story that I want to tell without being monitored and controlled. But at the same time, I also have a fulfilling job that pays me well. So I and don't go starving. So that's just, <laughs> I think that finding the balance and you'll be fine, you'll figure it out. Thank you very oh, much. Finally, Thank you. Uh, oh, she's coming in. Ida, go ahead. Berlin? Yes. Ida? I th I think we have uh, we have other questions, perhaps Gladys and, and Fadimata. Great. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, you, you, you mentioned a very important point, uh, which is accountability. And um, I, I'm really uh, interested in your your vision of um, ethics because you said that you you wanted to stay honest and ethically accountable and i wanted you to share with us uh, i had so i have a question how do you manage to to be ethically con accountable in some challenges spheres like um, humanitarian spheres or development spheres because we know that in certain circumstances um, well, it's the accountability is something that is not uh, taken into account that much, if I may say this. Thank you. Ida? Perhaps we can take the next questions for Dimeta and then answer both. I'm glad it's, um... Okay. Okay. Fadimata? Fadi? Okay, I don't hear it. Ida, do you want to answer perhaps the question of Lady? Sorry, I think her sister Fadi is not uh, coming in at the moment. Sorry, thank you. Sure, um, right, Gladys, another important um, question. Hi, everyone. I can oh, okay, hear you. Yes, yes, yes. 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 <laughs> Yes, we can hear you. Fadimata, come in. 
So I guess, well, while we wait for um, the next question, I can jump in and answer quickly Gladys's uh, question. It's very true that you need to be accountable. And I'll allude to what uh, Helena said before again, you really need to be honest. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's a delicate balance between um, telling the story of that person, but also uh, keeping their dignity. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? I can't see it, unfortunately. It can be very difficult. It can uh, also maybe Raju can go and then I... But um, at the end of the day, you're also thinking about what action you want people to take once they um, listen to that story that you are producing. So for me, one thing that I keep myself accountable uh, by is by asking myself, will people really um, take action because I have told um, this story? And also, um, am I being true to that person whose story I am uh, sharing? So I, I put myself accountable in terms of how would I feel if I was that person whose story that I am telling? And on the other hand, I look at the other person who's on the other side who's reading this story and I ask myself, will this person really be empathetic? You know, will they feel this story and actually want to do something? So I think having empathy and really understanding the person that you were talking about and also knowing that what you tell will really impact on this uh, person's life helps you to also um, stay accountable. Thank you so much, Ida. Raju? Thank you for the opportunity to listen to so many amazing people. And can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. We okay. Can. Thank you. So I just wanted to say that I have uh, been following this author. Her name is A. Atherzia, A T H E R Z I A, and she's a a woman who's been writing about about um, women's activism in Kashmir. Anyway, I just came across this book uh, a couple of months ago, and I wanted to share it with everybody because. It's just a, a, about a one about a woman who is making such a huge difference, uh, as we know in global tensions. There's global tensions everywhere. Recently, in India and China, had a tit for tat. Uh, there were lots of many lives lost. In India and Pakistan, have had this tit for tat going on. Uh, there's a lot more hot spots all over the world. And I was very impressed with this woman um, because she has written about this hot spot in Kashmir that is coming from a perspective that I have not heard because there have been approximately eight to 10,000 men lost, Kashmiri men lost. And so the women's voices and their stories have been mobilizing and have been inspiring and also been leading the fight to for justice to find these eight to ten thousand men that just went missing so i'm very inspired to hear that the young uh, the people that are coming up and the voices and the and in the, and the uh, questions and the comments and i'm inspired because i feel that the uh that that these stories that are inside of each of us um, make a difference and they'll make a difference to somebody. So thank you so much for putting this on. And I just wanted to make that comment to, for, uh, to you. Thank you, Raju. Thank you so much for, for sharing this. Fadimata, do you want to comment? Yes, hi. Hi, Verlaine. Hi, everyone. Sorry for the technological issues. I just wanted to thank uh, our sisters who uh, presented their stories. Um, so my name is Fadimata. I'm calling from Rwanda, but I'm originally from Mali, West Africa. I, I personally relate to your stories. I'm personally working in the development sector. I have been working in the development sector for the last 17 years. 
So I've been doing a lot of adolescent programming, trying to build adolescents' uh, self-confidence, leadership skills, public speaking. But I must, I must say that over the last recent years, over the past five years, I am seeing a surge in uh, around, around storytelling. And uh, I have been questioning myself, what does that mean for us, uh, particularly for us in Africa? Um, and recently, uh, through a discussion with one of actually with my, my manager, I realized that um, I'm not talking personally about myself that much. And that has something to do with what uh, cultural background and the upbringing as someone else raised it. Um, because in West Africa in particular, we are raised and we are always told to not talk about ourselves, not speak about ourselves. We have to let that to others to speak about you. Um, and then when we come into this competitive world and this new world, which is all about storytelling, we are challenged about talking ourselves, about selling ourselves and selling, telling our own stories. Um, so then my question to the speakers is, how can we help better uh, adolescents or young girls or even young boys who are still in schools in the schooling system? Because unfortunately, despite being like one of the presenters, I forgot her name, who was into writing stories, that was my favorite subject as well. But I have not been nurtured to write stories about myself or to write things about myself through my schooling system. Um, so how can we help? Um, the, the new generation, you know, to to get to to make best use of this technology, um, to also get the skills and the confidence to get out there and to share their stories, even if it's not only the academic writing, but if, knowing that yes, my story matters and the way I put it out there and the, is also important, and I can proudly get it out there, uh, whatever it is, because it will be it, it it's it's who I am and it represents who I am. So this is, a, I guess it's a challenging question, but I think we have to really help, um, I guess, part of mentoring, but also part of supporting the systems, um, the young generation, and also the sisterhood, because we are all struggling with this, talking about ourselves, telling our stories um, in, this, in this challenging and connected world. Thank you very much, Velen and all the team. This is a great job, thank you. Thank you, Ida. Helena, before we go to the next question, there's a, there's a question uh, from iPhone Guest. If iPhone Guest, sorry, we don't have your name, uh, could come in with a question. Thank you. Um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Hi, we can hear you. <laughs> Okay, um, I think Fadima said most of uh, what I wanted to say. Uh, like she said, I'm also um, from West Africa, and the storytellings are very important and they're powerful. My question is, how can we uh, be able to um, empower the younger generation to be able to come out and talk about their stories. Because first of all, I also worked in Sierra Leone after the war, and I have heard a lot of stories. I have seen people who have gone through a lot. But one thing I have seen was that the fear of coming out to talk about your stories, because you, have, you are afraid of being judged. You are afraid of somebody saying that it's not true. I don't believe her story. So what can we do to make sure that we can help and help build this, their self-esteem to tell somebody and say, you know what, your story matters. And people out there would love to hear your story, would love to help you, would love to guide you. And they would believe in you because that's what I have seen is that we have endless stories. We have a lot of stories, but because we are afraid that somebody will say it's not true. Somebody will say, I don't believe her. And so at the end, we tend to just keep quiet. And the other, the second thing is that sometimes most of these stories that happen to us, we think it's okay, it's normal, because we were raised like that. We were raised for us to believe that most of these things that happen to us is part of us, is part of culture. 
wherein is not okay issue is not part of us it's part of culture yes but it is wrong how can we help the younger generation for them to be able to talk about their stories and to be able to say this happened to me but i'm not going to accept for it to happen to another person thank you Great, thank you. V, can I go? Go ahead, dear. All right, okay, I'm just gonna start this and Ida will finish it. Um, thank you so much for asking the questions. I'm gonna start with um, accountability because I felt like I, I will have something to add to that. Um, well, I think the work of accountability starts when you start collecting the story from people. Um, and as someone who works on gender equality and gender justice, I do come across stories that are very harsh and hard um, of women going through a lot. And I think my accountability work starts when I start hearing them and I, I make sure that I'm hearing them fully um, and that I have uh, my full attention to how they want it to be narrated. But at the same time, while I'm collecting the stories, when I'm um, processing it, I also have a responsibility of delivering the message in a way that is strong and that connects to people. Because the idea of storytelling, yes, it's about collecting evidence, it's about collecting stories, but the way you deliver it, it has to be powerful enough for people to relate and to, to you know, connect to the story so that it comes back being much bigger than what you uh, sent it out to be. So that is a responsibility. And so I think accountability starts from listening to the stories, making sure that you're attentive enough and understanding the path and the story and the narrative, and that you don't get to mix your story in between, that you, you're not quick enough to judge and... Um, dilutes the whole entire concept and also being able to kind of divorce from the cacophony like it's very important to deviate from what people say in general and it's okay to take a risk at the same time and there are questions about working on the next generation what, how can we do that um, and that's a very important question but I think it's also important to think about us I think I care about my generation um, the Helena's generation matters as much as the generation before or after I think if I stay honest to my story, if I'm kind of trying to start that brave trend, um, I think it would be e easier for other people to pick it up as well, whether it's, we're talking about the young generation or even older generation. I think I have the responsibility and the confidence to inspire not just young people, but also people who, who are you know, much older than I am and they didn't get to do the work because of social constraints and cultural, what, what have you. But I think it's also important to focus on us. I think the people who ask this question, I would, want them to work away with this. Are you honest in telling your stories? Are you honest in confronting the social, the social cultural things that you talked about? Because the responsibility starts with you. Um, can you do it today? Can you risk being not liked? Can you, bring, um, can you be authentic? Is it okay for you to practice that? Because more than what we can teach, more than what we can um, tell people, I think the biggest lesson that we can um, give them is to be, and so they can learn from our actions not just our words. So it's important to stay true. And yes, mentorship helps, but personally for me, I want people to understand that I live my life this way. I tell my stories this way. I hope it inspires them. Um, I'm not buying into any audience and I hope that inspires them too. So the first act of doing that, the first act of trusting the next generation uh, with the powerful story is to be me myself today. And that, I think, is a great foundation for the work that we do. So I really encourage our sisters listening to this to be okay with selling, to be okay with uh, departing from the majority, to be okay to be different, mm -hmm. and to tell your stories authentically so that it can be an example for others as well, that the others can model and um, follow your you know, footsteps. I think that, that is very important. As much as you invest in mentorship, you invest in different kind of learning activities, it's okay to be you first so that others can learn from that. If we don't start the train today, then it doesn't really matter what you teach them in the class because they actually watch you. If you're not authentic now, but you tell them to be authentic, it doesn't really make sense. So I think the work starts from us and my generation and the people that are here in this uh, discussion here. Right. Um... Back to Ada, if I may add on on what Helena had said, um, you know, she's right. We need to start the conversation. Um, my social media, for example, um, and Helena's social media as well, um, we talk about a lot of things that are considered not to be the norm. There is backlash, but you also have to, you know, develop you, in the process. 
us is you will develop thick skin to deal with the backlash because that comes back to also um, the, what do you call it, um, the traditions and the cultures in which we are raised in, and someone raised it before, I'm sorry if I forgot your name, um, which is basically we're raised in cultures where girls are told not to speak, but we have to create those platforms, you know. Um, in most cultures where women uh, speak these days, they had to create um, those spaces uh, to speak. And we have such amazing um, opportunities to do those things these days. We have social media, um, we have blogs, and these are platforms in which I feel we can uh, use these spaces. So for example, I think um, the last speaker was asking about how we uh, teach to kids uh, or the speaker before in school to write, you know, it starts from me. I think if I am able to write something and share it with uh, a student, I used to teach and I used to teach um, English, I used to teach composition and grammar, and I used to direct plays in school. So it's about encouraging, maybe it's because I was in that space, but um, outside of that, um, through my writing, I feel like uh, I'm able to inspire other people to be comfortable enough to write. You know, you write about things that are considered uh, no-go areas in the African context, but you still write about them. Somebody is bound to be inspired by that. And also, I think, uh, you know, Zahara's Dream is an amazing platform, if I may say that again, because now you have a channel where you're meeting people who can actually write a story. Um, the last speaker who spoke from Sierra Leone said that they know of many um, young women who uh, want to share um, their story. It starts from me, you know. So someone came and told me their story and they're not bold enough to tell it themselves. Then I become a voice for that person, right? And I tell their story for them. Of course, the way in which I write it, like Helena said, I have to not add my biases. I, I have to tell it as that person um, wanted the story to be told. And I think that would encourage the person to want um, to tell more. So I think we sitting in these positions, we have the power and the tools to now start telling those other people who cannot tell their own stories, but they really are looking for a channel to tell. And I write for an African feminist blog called Afrofeminist. We have uh, writers from all across um, the continent. I'm not sure if we have any writers from Sierra Leone, but I mean, I would be happy to uh, write uh, blog pieces about any of the stories um, that um, the last speaker talked about. I would be very happy to be a voice for this. So this is a platform where uh, we have a lot of opportunities to really connect and also tell the stories of others who cannot tell it for themselves. Thank you. Thanks, me. Thank you so much, Hida. Thank you, Helena, and also our sisters for the very powerful questions. I think the next one is Zenret. Zenret, I, I saw you up in the in the chat. Do you want to come in? From Nigeria. Hello, everyone. Hi, hi, hi. I think um, the free Facebook for being here. So thank you very much for this wonderful um, webinar. It's really inspiring. Thank you, Zenra. Do you have a question? No, I don't. I don't have a question. All right. I saw that Vivian, uh, you had uh, another question. Just to let you know, sisters. Unfortunately, it's eleven. You know, it's it's uh, we're about to to wrap up. So perhaps if we can have one or two last questions, Ida, Helena, is it okay? Yeah, that's great. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Okay. Vivian, come in. Okay. Um. Hi, Relain. Thank you for the opportunity to ask my question. And I have a concern, you know, um, as sisters coming together to form this sisterhood, as much as we are trying to come up, to speak up, and to work on um, sharing our stories confidently, you know, being powerfully us, in whatever that we do or whichever field that we find ourselves. 
I find this disturbing that as sisters, it's, it's a challenge for us to um, support one another. In this, um, when we are working together or we are thriving or looking out for success, a lot of us leave our sisters behind, which I feel it's not right. So the question is, how can we uplift others? Because I feel there is this stereotyping among us. And another thing is perfectionism, because as sisters, we want to see things done perfectly, which gets us really worked out and stressed in attaining um, whichever goal that we set our mind to achieving. So it is very important for me that we look into this, we understand each other, we bring up advices to the table that could help us get through this. Um, breaking up with the sisterhood stereotyping and perfectionism among us as sisters. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vivian. Uh, if we have another question before we wrap up, or otherwise Ida and Helena can uh, can come in. Thank you. Right. Um, so, um, thank you for thank you, everyone. Really, this this has been really inspiring for both Helena and I. Um, right. So, the question of not supporting each other. Um, you know. There's one thing I've learned in life, not everyone is going to like you. And for the longest time, I used to do things uh, thinking that, okay, I am going to do this because this is how someone wants it done. And I really forgot about myself. I think in many ways, um, as women, we forget about ourselves. We get lost in the process and um, we fail. And I'm very... Uh, I, I'd like to know that I have failed and I, I really um, stand on that because that's what made me stronger. And um, it is sad that there are instances where women pull each other down, but I think it's important to take a recognition of that is going to happen and not to be that kind of person, you know. Uh, for me and Helena, we've been supporting each other for a very long time. And it's not just for professional things, you know, we support each other emotionally, um, we support each other if it's uh, academic writing or if it's even putting up a post uh, about uh, some of the activism that we do, you know, it's not everyone, I think it's important to find someone who really understands you, you know, and that'll really keep you on the positive sphere of things. Um, I think negative or energies are projected, really. If I'm with a negative person, I will be negative as well. So it's important to find uh, someone who really understands you or tries to understand you and someone who is in a similar path. And I think that would help you also continue discovering um, your path. There's so many women I look up to and there are women that I stick to. You know, I might not even uh, have a spoken to them but I just stick to them and you know I'll follow them on social media and I'll just just this week uh in the other in the UNDP and Aulin women in leadership discussion I discovered Dr. Zanator of Ghana I loved the way she articulated um how you can tell uh, people about COVID you know she said that it takes 21 days for people to actually understand a message you know and especially when you're talking about behavioral change so she said keep it simple break it down so that people can um, understand. Now for her, I have never met her. I'll probably never meet her. But the first thing I did was go to her social media page to just see things that can make me grow, you know? So I think it's important for us as individuals to find people who are in the same mental wavelength, for us to be able to continue in that um, positive um, journey. And there will be setbacks. Um, that's a fact of life. There will be set setbacks, but we shouldn't let that um, keep us down. I'll stop here. Mm. I just add a couple of things. Um, I don't think I have a lot to say, but it is very disappointing for us, especially women, um, to see that we don't really support each other as much as we should. Um, I don't know if it's an African thing. I don't know if it's an Ethiopian thing because I, I think it's different in different contexts, but I know for sure that in, the, in Ethiopia, 
and especially within the activism community, it's very, very hard to get along. Um, and as much as we get along on social media, I know the politics behind it is quite hurtful. I know that we tend to not be supporting each other a lot. And I've been in that space for over nine years. And sometimes I do face burnouts because I just can't stand us. It's not even other people that I'm not okay with. It's, it's, it's us. It's the, you know, the storytelling community. It's the activist community. And I, of course, I can't change what other people do, but I know that I can change what I do, that I'm responsible for my own act. Um, and I have learned to be kind to people coming up within that space. I know the space is intergenerational and intersectional that people come from different diverse backgrounds, but also young people come in and they want to check it out. And I don't want to discourage anyone. I know that the space is enough for everyone. I believe in abundance. I, it is enough. We can all be existing in the space. We can all shine. We, there is enough space for all of us to be great and good at what we do. And so that's the kind of mentality that I have. And I'm very lucky to have a friend like Ida because we understand each other a lot. And I've learned to depend on her. And I've learned to be that, that friend as well that she can depend on. And I know it's a two-way thing. It's not just her, it's also me. So that is something that I can do. I know it's very disappointing as a culture, but what we can do again is to change ourselves and to be as friendly as possible. I'm very open to anyone wanting, wanting to communicate, wanting to link up here or elsewhere. Um, and I believe in supporting sisters generally, not just for social media, not just through shout outs, but actually in life and practice. Because it's, it's complicated. It's already hard without us hitting on each other, kind of pulling each other down. Um, and I think it comes from, a, we always talk about this because we, we, we have those challenges here a lot. And it's about abundance. It's, it's about believing that it's not enough. I need to be the only one who shines out here. I need to be the only good storyteller. I need to be the only person who's, who's running this. And, and that's what patriarchy you know, uh, does to us, I guess. Uh, we, we believe that it's not enough, but the, the truth is it is enough. It's enough for everyone. Um, and we can use that space to support each other, to love each other, and to have meaningful impact in our lives. And that's what I chose to do. And I'm very grateful, again, to have a friend like that. Perfectionism, yes, again, it's very gendered. It's a very women thing. Um, I am a perfectionist. It drives me crazy. Uh, but I also have accountability partners like Ida who takes on, on me and tell me, like, no, 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 this is not okay. You don't have to punish yourself for doing this. It's okay to make mistakes as well. And I actually have this thing written on my wall, you know, look away, arrest your perfectionism valiantly, because it's really important for me to arrest my perfectionism and to be human. It's okay, again, to make mistakes. And I appreciate the burst of clarity that actually comes with failing, that I felt so many times, but there is so much clarity that came with it. Um, I've learned to let go, and I learned, I've learned to have friends who take upon those qualities that I have. I know that I'm perfectionist, so I tell friends, when I tend to be on the crazy side of things, please do, you know, uh, make sure that you tell me, no, 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 this is not okay. This is not okay for your mental health as well. And we put so much pressure on ourselves that we tend to be not okay all the time. And as women, again, it's a women thing. We want to get everything right. We think if we fail, people will know about us and it will be the end of everything. But it's not. It, there is space for all of us to make mistakes, to learn, and to be okay with the imperfections of life. That's how we learn anyway. Um, and that's all I have you know, for now. Oui? Elena, Ida, this was so powerful. I like the last sentence, you know, to be okay with the imperfections of life. And I, I just want to, to quickly build on, on, uh, on what our, our sister, sorry, on what our sister Vivian has mentioned, you know, the, what I call the pull her down syndrome. Ah, where do we go with that? <laughs> I think, you know, and I saw a comment from my sister Salama with actually within the, the chat box, she said something very uh, powerful. I don't want to believe that as women, uh, we have this, uh, this drive to, to pull each other down. And I think we see that. Uh, we have the example here of Ida and Helena. They're, they're more than friends, they're sisters, you know, and you can see even today the, the view powerfully talk, they're in the same house. <laughs> Although we, we had two different videos, so I think uh, just to, to, to build on that, and then I'll, I'll give the last words to our sisters, Ida and Helena, who have really inspired us and, you know, gave us the tools to really move forward on 
not only storytelling, but on tapping within ourselves, you know, to find the strength, to be able to, 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 to overcome challenges and, and be able to, to tell our stories the, the way that we want them to be told uh, as Africans and also as, you know, non-Africans, as, uh, you know, citizens of the world. And we had, you know, the, 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 the comment from, from Raju, for instance, uh, that was uh, also very relevant. So just on the pull her down syndrome, I think we have, we have all been victim, you know, uh, from, and I don't want to, to, to make it a woman's challenge because other men will pull us down as well. And I think Helena and Eva have stressed it when they share that patriarchy is a system where everything is vertical. And I really believe uh, that change has to start with us. It's really within our own uh, perceptions, the way that we, we create the world around us that we will see how, you know, um, this impact us or not. What I'm trying to say is, for instance, Zara Stream, the reason why we founded Zara Stream, and I don't want to even say I, because this is our dreams, you know, this is Ida Stream. Ida has been my sister for years. The first time I've, I've met her, I, I knew she, she would be my sister. Helena is our sister. A lot of, uh, of the young women here were all interconnected, you know, through what we would call invisible links. And once we understand and recognize that we're all uh, connected in that space, uh, sharing the same human experience. You know, we all want the same thing. We we want to to be the highest and truest versions of ourselves. We want to find within ourselves the power and the strength to be able to share our stories. We don't want to survive. We're tired of it. We want to thrive. We all want to live positive and, and powerful lives. And I think this is why also the, the, the talk is called Being You Powerfully. So looking at that, knowing that we all share this common denominator, it's very important to, to recenter that what the other person is, is a part of me. Ida is a part of me. Until the day I die, Ida will be part of me. The same for Helena and each of every one of us on this call, because we've shared an invisible link today. You know, we're all part of each other. So understanding that really allows us to 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 not step on others, you know, in the way that perhaps others might have stepped on us. And one of the previous Be You Powerfully talk actually was on, on that, you know, the power of compassion and centering healing. Uh, it was led by uh, Dr. Musonda. You can check her, her Twitter uh, account and watch the video on Zara's dream on the, the Build Your Power tools. And she shared something very powerful. She said that when people bleed on you, if you don't take care of that, of that, uh, of that scar, of that pain, you're going to bleed on others. So I think it's very important for us as women, even if sometimes we find ourselves in, in spaces where you know, we might get attacked, we talked about it for, for not, uh, you know, for, for defying the status quo. For instance, in Africa, we have a strong culture where women and girls are silenced. If you start to speak, you will have other women who are going to try to take you down because you're shaking the carpet and they're like, there's too much dust, what are you doing? You know, and that's what we call system maintenance. You know, they do reparations and make sure that the system keeps going. So when you come and you don't want to, to hold to that system, of course, you're going to, to face, um, you know, whatever challenges. And, and, you know, unfortunately, to the same, uh, there is light outside, there's the sun, and, and, you know, there's positivity. Unfortunately, the, it's like the yin and the yang you will always have uh, the other side of the spectrum. You will have negativity, you will have jealousies, you will have you know, all those negative feelings. And we're all humans. We need to recognize that, that we're all humans and that we all live in this duality. And that it's for us to recognize this duality and to choose, you know, it's a every day. It's a, it's a choice to choose uh, to side on the side of light, to do the conscious work, to recognize our own biases, and to understand that holding someone else's hand is not going to take anything away from me. You know, in the morning, sometimes I go by the river and I walk and I see the, the sun reflecting on the water and you see millions of, of shreds of light shining on the water and you never see one a powerful light looking at the other light on the other side of the of the ocean saying oh you're shining brighter than me because we're all part of one big picture and once we can recognize that and that my sister light shining next to me is not taking anything away from me instead you know it's actually giving me strength and energy and positivity that my sister winning 
is not a loss for me, that it's not a zero sum game, then we can actually move forward and really build on this sisterhood. And Zara's dream is about that. It's about understanding that my sister's winning is my winning, that we'll never get to a place where women, we can speak freely. If I'm not authorizing, even authorizing is, you know, if I'm not letting people around me thrive and be the best versions of themselves. Ah, we have Elena and Ida back to back on the same camera. <laughs> so just to, to finish on that, my sisters, I think, you know, as I said, life is duality it's for us to to choose every day to to commit to yourself to commit to to positivity to commit to light to commit to hold other people's hand to commit to making sure that if your sisters fall that you're there to hold her back that if she cries the same way that she would do for you and i'm saying that from personal experience i've, I've been hurt like many of us you know and i've been you know bitten and sometimes i felt like i was an abandoned dog on the side of the street and that and i would not be able to stand back up because it was really difficult but you understand that someone else and most of the time if not always it's your sister who's going to come and pull you up so you have to be that puller as well you know you have to be that change that you want to see and once you understand that giving is at the center, you, you know, you can overcome anything. So those are just some last words for consideration for the, for the weekend. But I want to leave the last, last, last words to our sisters, Ida and Helena, who have been, you know, graciously leading us, leading, leading us on, this, on this conversation and sharing their tools. And I'm sure, you know, you can connect with them online, on social media, chase them. I'm sure, you know, they'll be happy to, to get back. Uh, but uh, I leave our sisters the last words. Thank you so much. You. Okay. All right. Um, so thanks, Verlaine. That was really powerful. That really brought it, you know, down to what we were thinking about as well. It's like Helena said, it's about abundance. There is enough space for everyone. And I always say the same for the African narrative. There is really enough for everyone. There's no uh, need to, you know, have this grab culture, you know, and um, a lot of things that Verlaine said, I really agree with. As women, we really need to support each other. That's the only way we can beat all of the issues that um, hold us back. And I, I love. I was just reading through the comments uh, that are coming through, and you know, we also are very inspired today. We're so happy that you um, chose to spend your time with us. We are here for you. We really want to connect with you. Um, there are platforms that we can share with you to continue um, sharing stories. Um, we are happy to help with um, writing and also storytelling. There are some tools. I had thought of sharing some tools I use, but then I thought, you know what, you can even Google that. But I'm very happy to share some of the tools um, that I use. And also I wanted to add that career is not one path. You know, someone asked earlier, um, how did you, not necessarily how did you get there, but then um, I'm studying law and I want to be a storyteller. How do I combine that and things like that? You know, for me, when I was standing teaching in a class, teaching three-year-olds, there's no way I would have thought that that would lead to what I am doing today, you know? So to get to uh, where I am today, I have taken all manner of jobs. I've written freelance, I've done conference proceedings. I, I have done so many things. I studied history and then I studied uh, peace and security. I should have been a program person <laughs> or I should have been in a museum trying to preserve the, you know, history, running a project in a museum. But instead, I am, say, I am writing the story of those uh, people. So your career path isn't necessarily, um, you know, you don't figure it out at the beginning. It, you learn by the process and you need to be open to learning and you need to be open to, uh, you know, having someone who will hold uh, your hand. It's really important to find somebody like that because we all, and it's also important to recognize the mistakes that you make, failures. Acknowledging failures is really important because they are the things that make you um, uh, stronger. So like I said before, we are very happy to collaborate. We're very happy to share some of the, the tools that we use. So thank you so much again for joining us and I wish you all a lovely weekend. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you, V. I'm, I'm very, very grateful to be here, um, and especially for the platform that you have. I know it's growing, and it makes me really happy that to know that the sister is doing really well, and we're here to support you, not just today, but any other day that you want. Um, and adding up to what she said, um, you know, I chased Ida into becoming my friend. <laughs> I chose her. 
Um, the first time I wanted help with an application, I emailed her because I saw her running around one day and I thought her story was impressive. And I emailed her asking for help um, exactly five years back and we've been friends ever since. And I think from that story, what I learned is you can choose your friends. Um, you can choose the family that you want to have. And the same way you can choose your career as well. Uh, you know what is right for you. I think it's not something that we can tell you, but just trust in yourself to know that you deserve all there is. Um, you deserve the best of things. As women of Africa, specifically, we need to put ourselves first and understand that our desires are as important and as valid as anything else around us. Um, we can find it in our friends, we can find it in our colleagues, but that, that's very important to know what you want to do and to be powerfully going after that. The way that I emailed Chaser and made her my friend. <laughs> um, and with, within the career side of things as well, I think it's really, really important to know that there is no straight path and you can be doing so many things at once. And in fact, my motto would shame on me if I'm, you know, I'm on this earth to do just one thing. I know that I am more than that. I know that I'm not going to be defined by one act, one career, one friend. I am more than that. Mm -hmm. And that's what I push myself to do. We don't have the answers yet, but it, it feels good to be able to figure it out in this space. Um, and we feel powerfully connected to all of you. And thank you so much for being here with us. That's it. <laughs> Ida, Elena, Amy Saganalo, thank you so much. Perhaps uh, if your sisters are connected, if you want to unmute and, you know, give a last word and maybe say thank you and then we can disconnect. Thank you so much. Have a good weekend, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so very much. much. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank thanks you. to the so only much. man in the room. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Bye. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Bye. bye. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. bye. All right. Bye. Have a nice weekend. Thanks. You too. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much, Hilly. Thank you, Ida. That was powerful. Thank you, sisters. But we're going to chase you now. You have, you're going to have to come every month, huh? Yeah.